Hello and welcome. My name is Anna Thomas and this is the first episode of the Apple for the Teacher podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Firstly, let me tell you about myself and what this podcast is about. I'm a primary school teacher and live in the beautiful country of Australia. In the last few years, I have joined the growing number of people listening to podcasts. So I decided to combine my love for podcasts, teaching and storytelling to create Apple for the Teacher. Each episode will tell two stories, a bad apple and a good apple. Bad apple stories are about people behaving badly within the school system. They could be teachers, students, parents, or just general school staff. Some stories give accounts of teachers committing serious crimes, while others are about crimes against teachers or school staff. Good Apple stories will highlight commendable conduct by teachers and staff, people who have upheld the high standards of the profession. In this way, Apple for the Teacher will present a fair and balanced representation of the school system. You will hear stories of murder, suicide, hijacking, sexual misconduct, bravery, lawsuits, harassment, heroic acts, kidnapping, dedication and bullying. Although I will cover some distressing cases, my podcast is not about providing detailed accounts of serious crimes or the people who commit them. I will not be naming people who perpetrate crime to give them any further airtime. There are many true crime podcasts that do this and they do it very well. My focus is to celebrate good people and to share stories which bring something positive from otherwise tragic circumstances. This is what makes the stories worth telling. So I warmly welcome everyone to the podcast, whether you are a teacher or not. I have created a Facebook page and a private Facebook group where we can interact and share our experiences. I will give me more details about this at the end of the episode. So let's get to the first story, the bad apple. Firstly, I need to give a warning. This story contains details about a crime against an individual which may not be suitable for everyone. The stories in this podcast have been chosen because they hold a connection to me in my role as a teacher and as part of the education system. Many are stories where I can directly place myself into the shoes of the person being talked about. This particular story took place in Australia, and after hearing the circumstances of what occurred, it really struck home that none of us are immune to being victims of crime. It was the first time in my life where a crime was so close to home. As a teacher, I often go to my school on weekends and holidays to do preparation, which I'm sure many of you as teachers can relate to. There is really no such thing as holidays for teachers, and we get heckled for the holidays, but we've just learned to develop a good sense of humour and just laugh it off. So the teacher at the centre of this story did exactly the same. It was Easter 2015 in Australia. Stephanie Scott was a teacher who worked at a high school. It was Easter Sunday, and she went into her school to do some preparation. Stephanie was going on leave to get married, and she was getting things organised for the teacher who would be replacing her. Her wedding was six days away on the coming Saturday. She was 26 years old and was due to marry her childhood sweetheart. By late Sunday... Her family had failed to hear from her. The next day, they deemed her no-show serious enough to raise the alarm with the police. Five days later, on the Friday, Stephanie was found deceased. The killer turned out to be a cleaner at her school, who was there on the same day that she was. 
he had sexually assaulted and murdered her at the school, and she was found in a national park about 50 kilometres away. The murderer was eventually apprehended, but I'm not going to say his name as he doesn't deserve to be acknowledged in any way or given any more notoriety. I have purposely not provided the intimate details of the crime. The case went to trial and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. According to the murderer himself, he had exchanged a few words with Stephanie at the school on that Sunday. She knew he was there and just as she was leaving, she said to him, I'm going home now, have a happy Easter. As she turned to leave, he grabbed her from behind. The funeral service for Stephanie was held in the same venue where she was due to marry her fiancé. At her memorial, her father, Robert Scott, spoke about his daughter. Stephanie was a bubbly, bright, witty, intelligent, fun-loving girl and a young woman who obviously has impacted on many people here today. Our wishes for the future are that that will continue in your minds, that you remember her as the girl she was, and I'm sure wherever she is now, she would wish that to be the case. The tragedies happen. We can't change that. We can't deal with it any better than we have. But we do know that we had a great girl and we're going to continue to remember her for what she was. At the trial that ensued, Stephanie's mother, Marilyn Scott, read out a victim impact statement. I will just read a small part of her statement and put the full statement on the Facebook page. Her mother says, It was her dedication to duty and her students and her determination to fulfil her professional obligation that saw her at school on Easter Sunday. This really sums it up for me. It's just so heartbreaking reading this statement and it amazes me when you hear about the uh, family of a crime victim who stand up in court facing their loved one's murderer and give a statement. The amount of strength that it must have taken for Stephanie's mother to do this, really, how do you do it? I guess your love for the person is just so strong that it's the least that you can do in honour of their memory. I don't even know how you would do it. I don't know how I would do it. Perhaps you've been in this position and you are willing to share your story, so if so, get in touch with me. Now, as if this story wasn't tragic enough, it gets worse. 18 months after the horror of Stephanie's death, the Scott family faced another tragedy. They also bid farewell to Stephanie's father, Robert Scott, who was accidentally killed by a falling tree when clearing trees on his property. He was also a teacher. Three weeks prior to his death, he had stood by his wife's side as she fronted court to deliver her victim impact statement. Mr Scott was farewelled at the same venue as his daughter Stephanie. You just have to feel so much for Mrs Scott, a double tragedy. How do you go about dealing with such unthinkable events? Now, you can imagine how her school was affected by her death. They spoke about the best way to keep her memory alive. They had received lots of donations from the public and they decided that an outdoor amphitheatre would be built as a permanent tribute to her highly regarded work at the school. One of the Year 12 students, with the help of his father, created the design for the amphitheatre. It features a raised seating area and stage and a memorial wall in Stephanie's honour. It also includes four yellow pillars that hold the structure together, as yellow was Stephanie's favourite colour. I just think this is just so beautiful that an actual student from the school was able to actually be part of all of this. Now, although the perpetrator was sentenced to life, there may be more to add to this story. In May 2018, it was reported that Stephanie's family had filed papers in court to sue the New South Wales government. 
but there weren't any details given because the matter was actually before the court. So I don't really know what they were asking for. The only thing I can think of is that they may have been questioning why he was allowed to be at the school on a non-rostered work day. But then when you think about it, Stephanie was also there on a non-work day. So I'm really not sure what the basis of the lawsuit is all about. From my own situation, every teacher and school staff member has access to school after hours and the cleaners have master keys to enable them to access the entire premises. So it remains to be seen where this goes and I'll certainly be looking out for any further news and I'll let you know if there's a follow-up. So you can probably see how this story has a connection to me and why I chose it. I could have been Stephanie just going to school on a weekend but not leaving alive. After it happened, it was a topic of conversation at my school. We all realised that it could have been any one of us. I just couldn't imagine this happening to a teacher that I work with and the impact it would have on their students and the whole school in general. Our principal recommended that we always lock our rooms if we were at school, out of school hours, and it was interesting that some teachers couldn't believe that other teachers didn't lock their door, me being one of them. Schools are well known for attracting vandalism and break-ins, but I was never worried about my safety at school. We didn't live in a high crime area. After it happened, I stopped going to school out of hours for a while. I also looked at the cleaners at my school differently, which I know wasn't rational. I'm one of those people who's a very early bird. I always function better in the morning. I generally get to school at about 7 o'clock in the morning, even though school doesn't start until 9 o'clock. It's just quiet and you can get a lot done. Our cleaners work before and after school, so the cleaner would be cleaning my room in the mornings when I was there early, and we would chat and we got to know them. But after what happened to Stephanie, I got a bit anxious because there weren't many people around so early, so I started coming to school later. But after a while, I just snapped out of it. I realised that I can't go on living my life in fear and stop doing the things that I normally do. And it also wasn't fair to think of the cleaners in that way. So although Stephanie's story is just so tragic, it has made me aware of my safety and now I make sure to lock my classroom door and on the whole, I'm just much more alert. So before we go on to the next Good Apple story, I'm wondering if this has ever happened to you where a crime was just so close to home to you. You can either share your story on the Facebook page or in the Facebook group or I can include it in a coming episode. So just email your story to apple for the teacher podcast at gmail.com. If you want to, you can also do a recording of yourself telling me the story and I can put it directly into um, an episode. Well, that was quite a rough story, so let's change direction and do a good Apple story. This next story revolves around a school bus trip. Now, children going on a school bus trip is an integral part of childhood, and I can always remember how excited I was to be going on an excursion somewhere. And even now as a teacher, it's so hard to calm the kids down when we're going on a bus trip. This story took place in Italy in March this year, 2019. A school bus of children aged between 11 and 13 were on their way to gym lessons. The 51 children on this particular bus no doubt would have been feeling the same sense of excitement, but little did they know what would happen to them that day. It was noticed by the passengers that they didn't seem to be travelling on the route that they were expecting to. And then, quite abruptly, the driver stopped the bus and it was then that the awful ordeal began. The driver started yelling, Now we're going to the airport. 
No one's getting out of here. You're all going to die. I need to avenge the deaths in the Mediterranean. There are so many people in Africa who keep dying and it's the fault of the Italian Prime Minister. While he was shouting, he was waving a petrol can and a lighter. He threatened the students, saying that if they moved, he would pour the petrol and set the bus alight. He first tied the two male gym teachers to the door. He then ordered one of the female teachers to bind the children's hands. She was told to keep them quiet and collect their phones. Once the driver was satisfied that he had subdued everyone, he continued driving to the airport. One of the students on the bus was 13-year-old Rami Shihata. He was from an Egyptian background. When the phones were being collected, Rami said he didn't have his phone with him that day. However, Rami really did have his phone. While the driver was occupied driving, he was able to free his hands and he pretended to pray in his native Arabic language while actually phoning his father and alerting him that the bus was being hijacked. He had his head down looking through the glass door of the bus and was able to read the signs on the road, giving an exact location of where the bus was and where it was going. The police were alerted and the bus was finally intercepted. The bus rammed into police cars before eventually stopping. The driver then jumped off and set it alight. He had deliberately removed all the hammers to break the glass on the bus, but police were able to smash the rear windows and get passengers off before the vehicle was engulfed in flames. The ordeal finally came to an end without loss of life. Twelve children and one adult had been taken to hospital for low-level smoke inhalation and the driver himself was treated for burns. He was arrested and faces charges for attempted murder, kidnapping, resisting arrest and arson. The driver was a 47-year-old man originally from Senegal in Africa, but he had lived in Italy for a number of years and had Italian citizenship. He had worked as a bus driver for a number of years and was well known without any incident reported of his conduct. However, it did come out later that he had been convicted of sexual assault and drink driving, with many people asking how someone with a criminal record could be employed as a bus driver working with children. So let's look at his motives. Throughout the siege, the man had made the following comments. I could no longer see children torn apart by sharks in the Mediterranean Sea. Pregnant women dead. I lost three children at sea. So many children die at sea. So we should die too by being burned. Stop the deaths at sea. I will carry out a massacre. It came out later that he had been planning the kidnapping for a while and wanted the whole world talking about his story. He had allegedly recorded a video outlining his motives, which investigators are now trying to obtain. It was also reported that there was no indications that he was radicalised or had any ties to Islamic terrorists. So if we look at the climate in Italy at the time, Italy is located at the front line of migrants crossing the Mediterranean Sea into Europe. Italy's government has taken a hardline stance against migration from Northern Africa, curtailing search and rescue operations, which humanitarian groups say endangers lives. 
While his motive was clear, I can't condone the method that which he chose to make his protest. Endangering the lives of innocent children, the same children that he was protesting about. So, to finish this story, we need to talk about the boy, Rami. He was hailed a hero throughout Italy, and rightly so. In light of Rami's heroic actions, his father has called for him to receive Italian citizenship. My son has done his duty. It would be nice if he now acquires Italian citizenship, he said. We are Egyptians. I arrived in Italy in 2001. My son was born here in 2005, but we are still waiting for an official document. We would like to stay in this country. The Italian Vice Premier wholeheartedly agreed. He put his own life at risk to save his companions. It is thanks to him that the worst was avoided. I believe that the government should grant this request. There is citizenship for special merits that can be conferred when an exceptional interest of the state occurs. I will personally hear the Prime Minister in this regard. It is a special case and I believe that the boy, due to his gesture, must receive the citizenship of the Italian state. Now, normally in Italy, citizenship is granted to children of immigrants when they turn 18, a law that's been in place since 1911. But given the circumstances of what happened, the government stated that the process would be fast-tracked, while the driver's citizenship will reportedly be revoked. The children's case has reopened a long-running debate about the fairness of Italy's citizenship laws. The previous government said that it would change the law to make it easier to grant citizenship to children born to non-Italian parents in Italy, but the law was never passed. Meanwhile, many have questioned whether the government should be able to hand out citizenship as a reward, as in Rami's case, or to remove it as a punishment, as in the driver's case. Now, three months has passed since the incident, and I found an article online that said that citizenship still hadn't been granted to Rami. So this leaves me thinking, were they really serious or was it just a stunt to perhaps soften their anti-immigration stance? Now, I don't want to seem cynical, but that's how it's beginning to seem. When you look at the story online, you see multiple images of Rami posing in photos with government officials. So is that just a photo opportunity? Well, it's only early days since it happened, so I will reserve my judgment and f- continue to follow the story for any updates. So what a story. When I think of myself as a 13-year-old, there is no way that I could have had so much bravery and presence of mind to do what he did. Can you imagine the sheer terror he must have felt and also the other students watching him on the phone. I would have been terrified that the driver would see him talking and then kill him. And there also must have been another door in the middle of the bus. Um, He couldn't have been at the door at the front of the bus near the driver, otherwise the driver would have seen him. He also prayed in Arabic, knowing the driver wouldn't be able to understand what he was saying. Just how incredible is that, that a child could actually just think of doing that? This story just makes you realise that you never know what could happen. The number of times that I've been on a school bus, it's beyond belief to think that something like this could happen to us. The way this boy reacted, as an adult and a teacher, I'm sure that I couldn't have done what he did. But I guess... When you're in the moment, you just never know how you're going to react. But hats off to him, 13 years of age. Certainly I think that today's kids are beyond their years compared to my generation. Um, But what an amazing story. 
Um, as this incident only happened recently, I'm going to continue to keep track of it and hopefully there will be some news to share in an upcoming episode. So that brings us almost to the end of this very first episode. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed the two stories. My aim is to tell stories that have people directly connected to the education system. For example, Stephanie's story could have been told on another true crime podcast, but I chose it because she was a teacher and the crime occurred in a school by another staff member. Similarly, the bus siege was chosen because it was a school bus um, with a hero being a student. So just a few things now before we finish. I'm aiming to bring out new episodes every fortnight. I've created a Facebook page and a private group for us to connect with each other. So just go to the Apple for the Teacher Facebook page where you can find a link to join the private group. The group is a secure place where we can share our own experiences and I would really love to hear your stories as a teacher. So you can email me if you've got good or bad Apple stories to me at applefortheteacherpodcast at gmail.com. I would like to include your stories in future episodes. You can also make a recording of your story and I can just directly put it into the episode. I would suggest that you change the names of the people concerned just to protect their privacy. You might also know of a story that's worth telling, so let me know and I will research the story myself. So that brings us to the end of this first episode. I really appreciate you staying with me until the very end. So to end the episode, I will leave you with this quote. Just because you find one bad apple doesn't mean you should give up on the whole tree. Bye for now and remember to be a good apple.